If you'll take your Bible this morning, and we are in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We are wrapping up this series called God is Faithful Through the End. Not just to the end, but through the end. And that's where we're going to end today in this series. Um, because he doesn't just stop being faithful, but he's going to be faithful forever and ever and ever and ever. And so take your Bibles. We'll be standing, as you know, as we do each week here at the assembly. We uh, stand in, in honor of the reading of our passage. We'll do that here in just a moment as we read uh, Revelation chapter 20 and 21. And we'll read the first first seven verses. So I'll let you uh, kind of get ready uh, to do that. But it's interesting um, because when you think about God's faithfulness, and all this year we've been looking at God's faithfulness because our church, we celebrated a hundred years. This church has been established for a hundred years. Has it had its challenges? Absolutely. Has it had its victories? You bet. And even in the toughest and most difficult times, God has always been faithful. You see, it's not just the story of this church that was set in place, if you will, here in Salem Springs a hundred years ago. But if we had the time over several days to share testimonies personally of God's faithfulness, you would have the same story. I've had victories in my life and God has shown himself faithful. There's been challenging seasons in my life, and maybe you're going through that right now, and you can still say, I may not understand, but I know this, God is faithful. God is faithful. And what we've been seeing over these past several weeks is God is going to be faithful even through the end. Difficult times are going to come. You're going to have trials. You're going to have temptations. And until we are raptured out of this earth and meet Jesus in the air and we've gone through the timeline and everything has taken place, you will continue to see the faithfulness of God. It's pretty interesting because when Crystal and I felt God was calling us to Salem Springs a little over 23 years ago, when we knew that we were moving and we were relocating from Norman, Oklahoma and coming to Salem Springs, when we would come in and we were looking for a place to, to live, to rent, until we settled in and kind of found out what was happening, we began to look at the school, we began to look at neighborhoods, we began to learn as much information as we could of this town. I wanted to know about Salem Springs. I wanted to know about the surrounding area. I, I wanted to know where we were going to live. We didn't come here blindly. We felt God calling us, but we didn't say, okay, we'll just, find, we'll just find something when we get there. Or we'll find out about the schools when we arrive. Ashland was going into kindergarten, and it's still, it was true then, and it's still true today. Schools matter. Schools matter. So you find out everything about neighborhoods, schools, city government. And we drove around town and looked, and, and this was where we were moving. And so we wanted to know as much about it as possible. And it's the same with heaven. This is, this is a one message about the new heavens and the new earth. And I don't want you to stop just hearing the voice of your pastor teaching on this because there's no way in one message I could describe where we're going to live for eternity. So if you're planning on spending eternity in heaven, I want to encourage you to do probably what, what, what Crystal and I did when we moved to Silent Springs, but you probably did the same thing. You did your homework before settling. Now, I know that, that some of you, you, you've been raised here, you've been born here, but you still know your community. And so I plan to live throughout eternity, but I want to know about the place I'm going to spend eternity and the Bible gives us descriptions. And the more that you learn about heaven, the more homesick you become for heaven. And that's what we've been looking at. It's kind of funny how people view heaven and the conversations that go on. Uh, there's some little bit of confusion. There are people that actually believe that when we pass from this life, we turn into angels. Well, that's theologically incorrect. Nowhere in scripture does it say that we turn into angels. Because it sounds pretty cool that you're going to turn into angels and you'll get wings and you'll get a harp to play and you'll sit on a, okay, some of you have heard that same. <laughs> I 
Maybe, maybe we, we believe that we'll get our wings because there's a, there's a wonderful movie that my wife absolutely loves. It's her favorite movie at this time of year, and it's called A Wonderful Life. You and I know it. Every time a bell rings, An angel gets his wings. great movie, horrible theology. <laughs> great movie. And some even think that we will get our wings and we'll sit on a cloud and we'll play a harp. And then there are other, probably because of jokes, well, there was a man and a woman who got to the gates of heaven and they saw St. Peter, you know, and the husband looked at the wife and she said, I'm so glad we're going to be together. And the husband looks at him, well, hold it. The pastor said, till death do us part. You'll get that at lunch. <laughs> or some of you husbands are smart. You're not smiling. You're acting like you didn't get that. You're smart. And so we have these jokes about meeting St. Peter at the pearly gates. The jokes may be funny and we laugh, but theology is not there. Proper theology, I should say. Randy Alcorn made this statement. He said, Satan labors to give people an inaccurate view of heaven. He slanders three things, God's person, God's people, and God's place. I believe that we have become so desensitized, and we talked about this last week, we have become so desensitized with hell that people have used that word every day in their life to tell people to go to hell. We've desensitized, Satan has desensitized even believers. Oh, we don't say the word, but, you know, yeah, yeah, but we don't fully understand what hell is about. And we learned that last week. Today, I believe that we as believers also have kind of become uh, uh, desensitized is a strong word, but I really believe even some of our worship songs aren't talking about heaven anymore. They're talking about how I can make it here. And we need to make it here, but we need to also understand this world is not my home. Yes, God can give me power and and, and courage and strength to make it through the trials and temptation here, but he has a whole lot better place for me to spend eternity with him in. And so we we have to be careful that we don't become desensitized and say, well, it'll happen someday. I don't really know a whole lot about it. We need to be aware of heaven. So we're going to read the word of God this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand as we do each week. And we are going to learn the biblical view of the new heavens and new earth. So this, once again, is going to be more of a teaching, and I want us to learn this because when you, you know, we've gone through everything, uh, through the end times pretty much, I mean, the big events, but if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you either die in Christ or you're raptured into heaven to meet him in the air, you will be seeing what John saw take place. So Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. John is writing here. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of the heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne, saying, look, God's home is now among his people, and he will live with them, and they will be his people. And God himself, say that with me, God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And to all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. And all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, all these blessings that John has described and he has seen. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. So, Lord, thank you for the promise that you have given to believers of inheriting all these blessings that we see here in the book of Revelation. 
Not all of these blessings, but even the blessings in the other scripture as well. But these are the blessings that we look forward to because these blessings we will inherit when we see you face to face. So stir our hearts, make us homesick. Let us hunger to learn more about the place that we will spend eternity where you will be with us forever. Holy Spirit, I ask that you open up our mind and not let us just have information today, but allow us to have inspiration. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Everyone say a new heaven and new earth. Look at somebody beside you and say, I'm ready for a new heaven and a new earth. As beautiful as this earth is, and there's beautiful places here in Arkansas, there's beautiful places in other states. Colorado is one of our favorites, the mountains. There's, there's, there's beauty in, in standing on a beach and looking at the ocean and seeing the waves. And, and as far as you can see, there's nothing but blue water, depending on what beach you're standing on. But it's massive and it's beautiful. Even in its own unique way, the plains are beautiful. It's just interesting. And as beautiful as it is, yes, this earth is, there's, there's some ugliness in it because we as people live in it and we've caused the ugliness, but God created this earth and its beauty. I took a class in college that Crystal encouraged me to take, take because she said, well, how difficult can it be? And it was astronomy. It was a little bit tougher than what she thought. And it was way tougher than what I thought or I would have taken it. But no, and through that class, we would go out and we had assignments. We'd look up at the stars and we'd measure. And especially this time of year, you see posts on your social media of the sun rises in the morning. And especially when it's cool and crisp and you go out in the evening. And I know we don't really, I like, or I don't like, I, need to put, I don't need to put you in that box. I don't like the short days because I get home at six o'clock and it feels like 10 o'clock. How many's with me? You know, but there's something about when it's cool and crisp at night and you step outside and you look up and it seems like the moon is more clear during this year and the beauty of it. And, and on a very crisp, cool night, you can see the stars and, and it, it, you look at it and it's beautiful. But one day God is going to create a new heaven, a new earth that as beautiful as this earth is it's going to outshine any beauty that we have seen here on this earth. And so there's some elements that I want you to understand about the new heaven and new earth that we see in scripture. And the first one is simply this, there has to be a final destruction that's going to take place. There's going to be a final destruction. You say, hold it, pastor, you're talking about hope. You're talking about spending eternity in new heaven and new earth. Well, look at verse one and two. John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Look at this. For the old heaven and old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. Then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. So this earth and all of its beauty that we see now it's gone. It's done away with. The Bible, the scripture we just said, said it disappeared. There's a final destruction. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. What's going to happen to it? It's going to be gone. It's going to disappear. Isaiah the prophet even shares a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 17 and 19. He says, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will be, will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will, what? Create. And when you create something, it's new. And when you create something new, the old is gone. He says, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I'll rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and the crying will be heard in it no more. Does that not sound like what we just read in the book of Revelation in chapter 21? So this new heaven and new earth isn't just a new idea in the New Testament. Way back when the prophet Isaiah was prophesying, God spoke to him this prophetic word about the new heaven and the new earth. You see, the earth and heaven that we see now, uh, it, it will be destroyed. It will be done away with. And you can go back and look at verse 11. He says, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Revelation 20 verse 11, look at this. From his presence, earth and sky fled away. 
It's gone. It's destroyed. It's the final destruction. We saw how, how the second coming during the tribulation, first of all, during the tribulation there was destruction. We saw, you know, the, the, the trumpets, we saw the, the bowls, we saw all the destruction that happens to earth, but the earth is still intact. Then we see Jesus coming back, second coming with the armies of heaven, and he comes and there's a battle in the Armageddon and there's uh, Gog and Magog, and we see that men and women are destroyed, but there's still a remnant of people here on the earth. There are still people that are living, still people that are alive. But there's coming a time where there's going to be a final annihilation, a final destruction so that the new can be brought into place for you and me. So this is the final destruction that's going to take place. So after the millennial, the thousand year reign, Christ is going, uh, he, he's going to restore the earth after, after, after the tribulation. During the millennial reign, he's going to restore it in the universe. So what does that mean? There's a new heaven, a new earth. It means that that earth that has been restored and we're reigning here, go back to the message on the millennial reign, uh, there, everything will be gone. No Rocky Mountains, no Great Plains, no beaches, no United States of America, no seven continents, no third planet from the sun. <laughs> the earth itself and all that we know will completely be destructed so that the new construction can take place. This isn't anything new. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10 and 12. He also says to the Son, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. We see that, Genesis chapter 1. But then look at verse 11. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will fold them up like a cloak and discard them like old clothing. But you are always the same and you will live forever. So are you seeing what's going to take place? There has to be a final destruction of the heaven and earth that we see here in order for the new heaven and new earth to come to pass. So before that new heaven and new earth comes into existence, we are seeing scripturally where what we see today, this heaven and this earth is going to be done away with. So we see a final destruction. So what happens next? Well, it's not only a final destruction that takes place, but there's a new design that will be seen. Whole new design, whole new design. Everything that we see today is going to be different. Look, look at verse two. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I shared this a few years ago when we were talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb and the bride uh, of Christ being married, if you will, making a covenant, uh, making that covenant come to pass between Jesus and his bride. And I shared that, you know, after being in ministry for many years and doing many, many weddings, someone asked me not too long ago, Pastor, how many weddings have you done? And honestly, I'm not one of those pastors that keeps a log of them. Some of them I kind of want to forget. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I, I don't know how many weddings. I've, 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 got, I've, got a, I've done a lot of weddings. One of my favorite parts is still when the back door opens or whatever venue you're in and the bride is seen and everybody's standing there and I turn and you can almost kind of hear this, wow. And then I always turn my eyes to the groom because, the, you know, some people go ahead and they, they see each other. The, I can't remember what they call it, the first look or something like that. And so they, they spend some time together. But there's still people that do the traditional, I'm not going to, we're not going to see each other until I walk in the door and it's amazing the look on the groom's face when he sees the beautifully dressed bride. And when I say beautifully dressed, I'm not talking just physically. Because I have done weddings when there's been four or five or six people. And when the bride comes and walks down the aisle and they don't have an official wedding dress, I see that same look on the, on the groom's face. So I'm not just talking about outward beauty, I'm talking about the inward beauty. And I've seen grown men see the tear begin to just, not out of sadness, but out of, wow, what a gift that I'm about to receive. And I, I, I see this here in, in the description in this. Because in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 5, it says this, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things what? 
new. It's a new design. And look at this. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. It's not that the groom has never has not seen the bride before, but there's a newness. She's presenting herself not just as a fiance. She's not, uh, she's not presenting herself as just a woman or a lady. What they are doing is she is presenting herself connected with that groom forever and ever and ever until death do they part. But when we as the bride of Christ and we are adorned and we are dressed, not physically dressed, but spiritually clothed with the newness of Christ. And when we come, he says, he says that, that, that what we see is, is it's like God's, this, this city that's coming down is like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And so picture that. I mean, we love new things. How many loves new things? Okay, I know that there's people that like to go and bargain hunt at yard sales and Facebook marketplace and eBay and everything. But, but if, I, if I tell you, you know, I've got this 1972 uh, Lincoln that's got 345,000 miles on it. How many, you know, if you want that, or you know what, I've got a brand new Chevy pickup, 2025, it's loaded. How many go, oh, I want the 72 Lincoln with 275,000 miles. Don't give me that new stuff. No, you wouldn't, you will take the new. Y'all are acting way too holy this morning. <laughs> we like new things. We like new things. And we are going into the season where you are going to buy new things, probably for some family members that you're not really that crazy about. But the good thing about that is you can buy them a new thing that they don't like. And they'll still receive it and act like they like it. How many has that kind of Christmas around your house? <laughs> Y'all are good. No one raised their hand. They just laughed. We know who you are. But, but it's amazing because right now when you buy something, it's either new or new and improved. When you buy something, if you bought something today, probably more than a month away, it's going to get scuffed. I mean, that happens with shoes. I bought a, a pair of shoes uh, not these. It was a different brown pair of shoes. No lie. I probably had them a month. And I, I scuffed them. And it wasn't just a scuff. It was a tear. Oh, some of y'all, you feel that pain. And I was like, I just bought these new shoes. They're not even broke in yet. And the, the leather was peeled back because I hit, hit like a curb, you know, a bumper, a curb bumper. And I was like, I just run these shoes. They're not new anymore. I hadn't had them that long, but they weren't new anymore. How many understands what I'm saying? You buy something new and it doesn't take long because when you buy it, it's either already old because it's technology or it's going to get old and you'll have to replace it. You know what I'm talking about. In fact, here, here, here's, some, here's some pictures of some new and improved because this is the best that we can do. Pepsi Zero. How many like Pepsi Zero? That's why they're trying to make it better. Look at this. New improved taste. I don't, I think they still need to work on that. Someone went in and I, I think Crystal told me this the other day. She saw someone ask for, they were in a restaurant and they said, uh, do you have a Diet Coke? And they said, no, we have Diet Pepsi. Will that be okay? And they said, will Monopoly money be okay? <laughs> I love it. Uh, so so here, here's another product, new and improved. Uh, Rice Krispies. How many Rice Krispies people do we like? <laughs> Snap, crackle, and pop, right? I don't know how you can improve on snap, crackle, and pop, but, but this is new and improved. The, the, the next product here, here, this is something, uh, makeup. You're always looking for the no, uh, what's it called? No tears mascara. Or waterproof. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Just be glad that your pastor has no idea what kind of mascara that ladies wear. <laughs> I don't wear makeup, so I don't know what it is. But I know, I mean, Mary Kay and Avon and all these, you know, Maybelline. I mean, always new, improved, always new, and all the other, you know. Okay, here's another product, moving on. Technology. We get sucked into the latest and greatest technology because it's new and improved. I don't care if it can call somebody, I just have to have the best camera. This is not a phone anymore, this is a computer with a camera. Right? 
The, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm an Apple guy, so I have an iPhone, and I know there are some Androids out there. And any, that name, Android. Woo! <laughs> Y'all aren't as proud as the Apple people because they would have already been shouting about, you know, the new improvement. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 the new iPhone that came out, you know, the 16, how many is still, you still have an iPhone and it's maybe a, I want, I'm just going to do, this is way off, okay? But how many will just give me a little bit of time? Okay, all right. I want to know who has the oldest model of iPhone. So, how, who has a 14? Anybody have an iPhone? Okay, 14, 13, 13, okay, 12, 12, 11, (laughs) wow, man, oh my goodness, did you just hold up six fingers? You have an iPhone 6, you have an iPhone 6, anybody have a 6, 666, you do not want that number, okay, you got a a 4, iPhone 4? Three. Oh my goodness. Anybody beat iPhone 3? If you, nobody is raising their hand. Hey, we want to stand up. I, we want you to stand up and cheer you, man, because iPhone 3. <laughs> We're talking about generosity this month. We're going to take up an offering and get him at least an iPhone 5. But it's all about marketing, the latest, the greatest, the new and improved. And, 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 so, and I've got to move on. I think we've got one more uh, picture that may, cleaning supplies. How many is looking for the latest and greatest cleaning supplies? You know, the new and improved cleaning supplies, that fresh smell, that fresh clean, OxyClean, you know, I mean, all these things. And if you're not careful, listen to me. If you're not careful, we will be inundated with a new improved iPhone, Android cleaning, and it will help us or hurt us think about the new heaven, new earth as just a new and improved heaven and earth that I see here. And that's not the case. I will make all things new. Remember, the old has gone. And I'm creating a new design for the new heaven and the new earth. In fact, I want you to see something here in verse 1. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed. Look at this. The last part of this. And the sea was no more. The sea was no more. Have you ever seen that before? You see, this is definitely a new, fresh design considering that three-fourths of our present earth is made up of ocean. In fact, your body is mostly water. 90% of your blood is water. Your flesh is made up of 65% water. If you don't drink, you will die. And yet, the new heaven and new earth, there will be no more sea. Oceans and seas separate people. And in heaven, You'll have access to everybody when you want it. No more sea, no more ocean. You say, well, hold it. What what about the crystal sea? No, no, no. You've got to understand, and you can look, because in chapter 22, there is the river of life clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God in the new city, Jerusalem. But there is no mention of sea or ocean, lakes, tributaries, gulfs, like we are aware of here on earth. It's interesting to think about that. A new heaven, new earth with no more sea. Well, where will we get water to drink? You won't have to drink. New bodies. New, I mean, everything. It's a new design. And so you will, it, it's amazing when you begin to look at this because the old has passed and I'm seeing everything new. The final destruction is taking place. There's a new design that's going to be in place. And then thirdly, this is wonderful. There's going to be a new divine presence that will be experienced. A new divine presence that will be experienced. Look at verse three and four. 
I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. I want you to pause and think about what we just read. I want you to think about what we just read. Think about it. God's home is now among his people. God's home is now among his people. God, break it down, God, the creator of the universe, his home, his dwelling is with his people. Think about that. A new divine presence God will be living among his people. He will be with us. Well, Pastor, God's with me now. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. Yes, that is true, but there's going to be something that we have never experienced before, and it is a divine, glorious, holy presence that our current mortal bodies cannot stand in. But when our mortal bodies take on immortality, I can stand in the presence of a holy God and not just just fall because my body can't handle it, but I will fall in awe of his and worship him 24-7 and all the time because he is such a great God and I will experience his presence like I have never experienced his presence before. I know he's with us now, but just knowing that God will be with us in a divine manner, in our immortal bodies, we'll be able to experience his presence like we've never been before. And because of God's divine presence, there are going to be things that we won't experience. Yes, we'll experience his divine presence, but there are things because of his divine presence that you and I will never experience before. No more death. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more disappointments, no more doctors, no more funeral homes, no more funeral directors, no no more morticians, no more dentists, no more cavities, no more vitamins, no more supplements, no more Medicare, no more Medicaid, no more hospitals, no more nursing homes, no more Alzheimer's uh, units. Now, come on, church, I'm talking about we will experience divine presence and we will also not experience things that we have to experience here on earth. No more hospice care, no more walkers, no more hospital beds. No more moisturizer cream (laughs) for those that use it. These are things we won't experience ever again. I think one of the best ones, and I I know all of them, I can't rank them, but as I was praying, I was thinking about this passage of scriptures and the things that I personally won't ever experience again. Honestly, no more death, no more pain, those are awesome. But I think one for me, I will never, ever experience disappointment again. You say, why is that one so? And it may just be, and I'm just going to be very open this morning. In ministry, you see a lot and experience a lot of disappointments. Intentionally, and most of them are unintentionally, to be honest with you. And so that was one that kind of stuck out to me. I'm going to ask you, which one sticks out to you? For some of you, you're in a season of grief. And so for you, no more pain and no more death. For some of you, you've got a bad report from the doctor and so no more sickness is what what really is important to you. And that's okay because it doesn't mean all the others aren't important. It's just where we're at in the season of our life. But when you start thinking of whatever you're dealing with, you will never experience that again in the new heaven and the new earth. John chapter 14, very familiar passage of scripture, verses one through three, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. That, that if, if, it, if that were not so, I would have told you that I am going, I would have told, I, I, 
would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. Say that again. I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. So Jesus is saying, I, I'm leaving you, but I'm preparing a place. Now, we won't arrive at this place when we are raptured out of this earth. The place that he is speaking of is the ultimate New Jerusalem, the ultimate heaven, because that's the place where we're going to spend eternity. And the last part of Revelation 21 describes this holy city and the New Jerusalem. And that's a, that's a whole other study for another time. We don't have time to unpack that this morning. But John did his best to describe And once again, the new heaven, new earth, our minds can't even comprehend it because we put it through our our earthly and world view. But John describes this holy city, the new Jerusalem. And John did his best to describe it, but our minds can't even begin to fathom how big and how beautiful and how wonderful it is. So what I want us to know from this series and from studying the book of Revelation, just we've just kind of hit the top water here. I want you to become hungry for heaven. I want you to learn more about this place where we're going to spend eternity and we're going to live. But I want us to become so hungry for heaven that we will begin to pray, Lord, help me share this excitement and the reason why that people need to give their heart to Jesus Christ. And so from the beginning, God prepared a place of perfection for man to live. It was the Garden of Eden. Sin entered the garden and entered because of man and woman's sin, paradise was lost. But God's going to win in the end because paradise will be gained. A new heaven and a new earth. He's going to have his people experience heaven like they've never experienced it before. Listen to me. I'm going to close here. From From the beginning in Genesis, God's plan was always for us to live not just get by, not to live even in a fallen world, but his plan from the very beginning was for man to live in paradise. If you go back and look at the description of the Garden of Eden, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And once sin entered into this world because of man and woman's decision to rebel against God and be disobedient, even though it's beautiful, We still have to deal with the ugly side of this world. But as you begin to see all the challenges and all those things that the enemy tried to take away from man and and, and destroy God's plan, you read from Genesis all the way and you begin to read the book of Revelation where you and I have been for the past several weeks, you see the contrast. In Genesis, the sun is created. In Revelation, the new heaven, new earth, the sun is not needed. In Genesis, Satan has victory in the garden. In the book of Revelation, Satan is defeated and thrown into the eternal lake of fire. Sin enters humanity in the book of Genesis in the beginning. But in the end, in Revelation, sin is banished, never to be no more. In the beginning, in Genesis, people run and they hide from God. But in the end, Revelation, people are invited to live with God forever. In Genesis, in the beginning, people are cursed because of the sin that they have committed. But in Revelation, the curse is removed. (laughs) And no more pain, no more death, no more crying, no more disappointments. In Genesis, tears were shed because of the sins and the sorrow for their sin. But in the book of Revelation, in the end, all sin, tears, and sorrow are all gone. In Genesis, in the beginning, the garden and earth are cursed because Satan rules and he reigns and he's in it. But in the end, we see that God's city is glorified and the heavens and earth are made new and Satan is no longer around to tempt, to bring challenges, to bring trials. In Genesis, in the beginning, paradise is lost. But in the book of Revelation, we see paradise is regained. And in Genesis, we see that people are doomed to die because sin is in the world. But I love this. In the book of Revelation, death is defeated and believers live with God forevermore. God is faithful through the end. 
He said, Pastor, what's left after this? Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Is that your prayer this morning? He's coming quickly. Is our response? Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. He hasn't come yet. We don't know when he's coming back. But until I take my last breath, or until I hear that trumpet sound, we are here on assignment to share the love of Christ and the promised hope that we have of a new heaven, new earth with those who do not believe. Would you stand this morning? This past weekend at Fall Conference, the, the theme was simply good news. How many sing for, for the good news? How many heard good news this morning about the new heaven and new earth? You know, good news is something that you want to share. We have good news and we have bad news. Bad news, we're very, um, we are careful who we share that with. But when, when it's good news, you want everybody to know. I, I've never visited with a couple that have just given birth to a, a child. And talking to them, I've never had one couple say, now pastor, don't tell anybody. We, we're just gonna keep this between us, okay? No, they're, they're like, you tell everybody. I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna rent an airplane and ride it in the sky. We're excited about good news. And I believe that we have the best good news as believers in Jesus Christ. We sang about it at the very beginning of this service. Goodbye yesterday. I'm no longer living in my past, but I have a future that God has for me and I'm ready for it to take place. Maybe you're not ready for that good news because on the flip side of that coin, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, this is not good news. But you can receive the good news by accepting him as your personal savior. You see, the only way that you're going to experience what I talked about this morning is to make Jesus Christ the King of Kings of your, of your life. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not saying a prayer, not just coming to church, not just taking communion, living according to his word. And that's not easy. And you need to think about it. Jesus teaches us, you need to count the cost. Because to follow me, it's not gonna be easy. But we read it, those who live a life of victory we will inherit these blessings we talked about this morning. The road is difficult. The road is challenging. Are you going to have difficult seasons as a believer in Christ? Absolutely. Are you gonna have pain? Unfortunately, yes. Are you gonna deal with depression and discouragement? Unfortunately, yes. Because that, being a Christian does not make me immune to the difficulties of this world. But I've got good news for you. Stay true to Jesus. Stay true as a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ. Because every tear, every pain, every disappointment, every sorrow will be worth it when you're standing in the new heavens and the new earth. It'll be worth it all. It'll be worth it all. So don't give up. Don't give up. I want to encourage you. I God is speaking to some people, and I don't, it may be just one, but I want to encourage you because I really feel in my heart that God is speaking to you in assignment. We just finished talking about the new heavens and new earth. We talked about the end times. We talked about every prophetic word about the second coming, not just the rapture, the second coming of Christ has been fulfilled. The next event on the timeline as we study scripture is the rapture of the church. And the Bible teaches that that is gonna take place like a thief in the night. The whole world's not going to notice and see what takes place. 
the second coming when Jesus comes with the heaven's armies, everyone will see him then. But I want to encourage you because I really felt in my spirit that God is giving some people an assignment. And the assignment is, it's time to get serious about sharing the love of Christ with that coworker, that friend, that family member. And you have, you've been shy about it because you're afraid of rejection. And I just want to encourage you, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. He'll give you the right opportunity to share. But I want to speak encouragement to you because they are not rejecting you. They are rejecting the new good news of Jesus Christ. Right. Nobody likes rejection. And I believe the enemy uses that to keep us from sharing the good news of Christ. So during that quiet time, and it's still in your heart, the Lord is giving you an assignment. And I want to encourage you to step out in faith, have that conversation. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to know all the books of the Bible. You don't know, have to know everything about the end times. Listen to me, we said this time and time again, share your story. Just share your story. So I don't know a lot about scripture. I'm not a Bible scholar, but I do know this. I know what Jesus has done for me. Share your story. So you've got an assignment today, not from the pastor, not from this church, but the Holy Spirit. He's speaking, he's speaking, he's speaking, he's speaking. So don't put that assignment on the shelf. Zero in on it, okay? Next year, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about staying focused. Staying focused, okay? Right now, we need to stay focused on the assignment that Jesus is giving us because time is short. Time is short. So share the good news of Jesus Christ in love. Take them as far on the journey as you can. Invite someone else that you feel like is maybe more mature and more knowledgeable. Invite them along in the conversation. Salvation is instant. Sanctification and discipleship is a lifetime journey. Okay? So, you've got your assignment from the Holy Spirit today. Okay? Now, here at the assembly, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but we also believe in making sure that that is on point. And I'm putting myself out here this morning, and I don't want you to raise your hand because I'm the pastor, because I did not say that. The Holy Spirit spoke that through me. And you're here this morning, so you know what, pastor, that's me. The Lord's dealing with me on assignment to share more about his love with a certain person. Would you raise your hand? Just want to test. Yes, 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 yes. See, is this not awesome how the Holy Spirit works and encourages us? And so those that raised your hand, you have a special assignment. The rest of us, we're not off the hook. We still have an assignment to share the love of Jesus. All right? So as you leave here today, remember the assignment that Jesus has given to us because I want... I, we love you so much, we want to spend eternity with you, okay? We don't want to just share a meal with you. We want to spend eternity with you forever and ever and ever. Amen? Amen. How many is glad you came to service today? Yes.